morning, everyone. Good morning. I am so excited that we are here together today to talk about BAM, Rise Above Stigma, the Madison Parish Town Hall, where we want to move Tallulah forward to a brighter future. So today, we want to hear from all of you, get your input, get information from you about what we're doing and what we're seeing around stigmas in the uh, Madison Parish. Stigmas around mental health, stigmas around substance abuse um, treatment. We want to know what are the things that are going on. So that's why this, this conversation today is so vitally important. My name is Dr. Katrina White. I am the Divisional Director for She Raised and Associates here in Louisiana. And I am so excited to be here today to work with you all to talk about this, this viable issue. Um, as we are um, working together today, we will have um, a couple of things that we will talk about and some people that I'd like to introduce. The first person, next slide please, that I'd like to introduce today is Ms. Julia Albert. No, I'm sorry, before I introduce Ms. Julia Albert, um, I do wanna just say, next slide, next slide please. I do wanna say that um, we are coming together from Northeast Delta Human Services Authority, she raised an associates in pre-K and pre-K pre 12 and beyond to bring this town hall to you. Um, I know Ms. Cantler or Dr. Cantler will be on uh, briefly or sometime throughout our time together and I'll let her give a little overview of pre-K 12 and beyond, um, but they are a valuable resource in the Madison Parish area. Next slide, please. Tracy, would you like to go over, or Raylet, would one of you like to go over Chi Raising Associates and what we bring to the community? Yes, this is Tracy. I'm so excited. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Thank you, Northeast Delta Human Service Authority. And mostly, thank you, Madison Parish, uh, for your engagement and your, your organization of today's town hall. She uh, Raises is excited to partner with, with Northeast Delta in putting this up. Uh, this project on Rise Above Stigma, and we just really are here to support you all in the Madison Parish area to really build strong relationships, really provide effective service to you all, and really impact the mental and behavioral health services so people can access them by reducing that sense of stigma that keeps them from, from accessing those services, both from a provider side as well as the individual side. So we're excited to be a part of this today. We're excited to be a part of this project. And we thank you all for coming. And it's not too late. If you have friends out there, invite them. Tell them they still can get on and be a part of this today. So thank you, Dr. Weiss. Yes, yes, yes. Invite them, bring them on, tell them, come on, get on this on this amazing call today. Um, now I'd like to have uh, Miss Julia give us an overview of um, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority and the amazing work that you all are doing. I know that we're going to revisit this too a little bit later, but I do want um, people to hear about the amazing work that you all are doing. Thank you, Dr. Weish. So again, my name is Julia Albritton, and I am the Special Initiatives Manager here at Northeast uh, Delta Human Services Authority. And um, here at NEDHSA, we provide mental health, addictive disorder, prevention, wellness, and developmental disability services to clients all across the 12 parishes of Region 8. And uh, Madison Parish is one of those, it was one of those parishes as well. So um, we provide a lot of services to the Northeast Delta region, whether it be for, you know, mental health, addictive disorder, counseling, we have peer support centers, and we'll talk a lot about those later um, because we have all of that information conveniently located in a mobile app that is really helpful um, for those who need a one-stop resource for um, anything related to the behavioral health field. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about our vision, mission, and tenets. Um, if you, Rayla, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So here at Northeast Delta HSA, we have a vision to build a unified Northeast Louisiana where individuals are thriving and reaching their full human potential. Our mission is to serve as a catalyst for individuals with mental health, developmental disabilities, and addictive disorders to help them realize their full human potential by offering quality, excellent care with greater accessibility. Three tenets that guide our actions are greater access to services, excellent customer service, and quality competent care. 
And thank you all for having us on today. Thank you so much, Ms. Julia. I am trying to refrain from calling you Dr. Julia. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Julia, for, um, for for giving us the overview of Northeast Delta Human Services Authority. And again, we will revisit all of the work that in the services that you all bring to the community um, here in the bit. Uh, next, I'd like to have uh, Tracy, would you like to take this one? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. And yes, you are right. Uh, led by none other than Dr. Sizer, we are so excited to be a part of this partnership. So thank you, Sister Julia. Our next slide really focuses on the importance of what Dr. King has always, and many things he said so many times in different ways. But this is one of his uh, quotes that really, we think, really impacts, even today, uh, the importance of really engaging each other. Well, he says an individual has not started living until he can rise above rise above you all, keep that in mind, rise above the narrow confines of, the, of the, his or her uh, individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of our humanity. And if we, if we think it's appropriate and apropos, and really connected to, if you will, uh, the importance of rising above stand, uh, stigma. And we know that what you all are doing in Madison Parish and really with this process and what Northeast Delta is doing is we're trying to help folks rise above the thinking that this is only it, that we can really impact our full parish if we engage in a stronger strategy to rise above stigma. So thank you, Dr. Weiss, for that. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and I do know that um, before we before I introduce the moderators um, for today, I want to kind of go back and just have uh, Ms. Raylet, if you'd like to talk a little bit about the survey um in and, and place that link in the chat yes ma'am thank you dr watch is this the oh i'm sorry can you all hear me yes ma'am okay we're going to place in the chat box we have a community survey that will be placed in there we also have the food and security survey that will be placed in there. And then we have at the very end, there will be an evaluation survey that will be placed in the chat box. But right now we will begin to place um, two surveys in the chat box for you all. I think one is already in that was put in at the beginning, but we will place another survey and um, Ms. Julia, she will explain the importance later on about that food and security survey, okay? Thank you all so much. Great, thank you. And if, if you can, can um, go ahead. Sure, if I can interject, just not to have them both at the same time, if it's all right, I'll uh, post uh, Ms. Julia's, uh, the, the, the food and security survey when, when Ms. Julia is talking about that. That Perfect. work all right for everybody? Yes, okay. thank, thank you, Dr. You. Lisa. And um, are you gonna replace the, um, the other survey in the uh, chat again right now, Dr. Lisa, since other people have joined. Um, I sure can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing our moderator today. And um, Ms. Beverly Ross um, is a graduate of the University of Louisiana at Monroe. She's an education liaison for pre-K Twelve and beyond at the Academic Center for Families and Children located within Tulula, Louisiana. She has worked with the field of education for over 40 years in Madison Parish. And Ms. Beverly was previously a member of Louisiana Association of Educators, National Education Association, along with several community organizations. Ms. Beverly is a mother, a sister, an aunt, and an extraordinary passion for children. So with that, I welcome Ms. Beverly Ross. She will be co-moderating today with me. Um, my name is Dr. Katrina White. As I, again, um, I am the um, Divisional Director for She Raising Associates here located in um, Louisiana. I am also an adjunct professor at Xavier University in Cincinnati. For all of those Steeler fans, um, it's the Bengals territory on here. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I am a mother of two, a grandmother of two, 
And I, um, I, I just, I'm absolutely passionate about this work. I have worked in the behavioral health, mental health field for over 25 years um, as a, a consultant, as a community outreach specialist, as a coalition development <laughs> and coalition developing, as a trainer, as organizational development. I am just so passionate about this work. Um, and I have also co-developed a manual um, titled Building Prevention with Faith. It's a faith leaders toolkit on how to integrate prevention within your congregations. Um, trained in the Boffin's life skills, 40 developmental assets, celebrating families, all kinds of stuff that, um, that, that I absolutely am passionate about and bring to the table. But I don't want to exhaust you all with my bio because it's not about me. It's about you. It's about the community and really understanding and learning and um, about what's going on in your parishes. So what I would like to do is turn it over to Pastor Matilda Johnson for a prayer to prayers into the day. Good morning, everyone. We are elated and excited to be here with you. And I truly believe her that I, we start nothing with prayer because without God, nothing is possible. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we come this morning, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for everyone that's on this line this morning. We thank you for the programs that has been instilled from these wonderful people. And we know without you, they will be nothing. And without you, none of us will be nothing. So we ask right now, Lord God, that you bless this program. Bless each and every one that's a part of this program. Crown their head with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And Lord, we know we live in such a tedious time with everything that's going on. But with you being the head of our lives, we know that it's nothing impossible for you. So we are asking right now, Lord God, that you give them the wisdom and wisdom and knowledge to do what they need to do. We see, Lord, they that they are educated. And Lord God, we ask for your spiritual education as well as your anointing to go and do whatever needs to be done to help our children as well as our community. We are thanking you in advance for everything that you have done, that you're doing, and Lord, that you are going to do in the future. Bless the host. Bless each and every one that's a part of this program. And bless each and every one that's tuning in today. And let us all go out and be better, better workers for our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Tracy. For you to now go over the guidelines of uh, COVID-19 as recommended by the CDC. And, and thank you, Dr. Weiss. And, and one of the things that we want to do, even though we're doing this in, in, in a virtual format, uh, we always know it's very important. And the impact that COVID has had on our communities um, and here in, Ma in Madison Parish and, and beyond. And that, so we want to always bring these guidelines up as an important process and understand that you know, it's very important to get a sense of knowing about the new the virus that's out. Uh, wash your hands often, you know, as much as you can. Follow these pieces that you see on the screen. You know, obviously wearing those face coverings when necessary, especially when you're collect when you're at home gatherings as we get ready for the for this holiday season. It's you know making sure that we do the things that are necessary We're around each other in person, that we follow these and we do what's necessary in monitoring our daily health. But most of all, although we, as we learn about the importance of rise above stigma, that we also learn about what we become knowledgeable about this vaccination, because it may have an impact as we move forward in getting folks to understand the impact of of stigma as well. So I wanted to, we wanted to bring you these as a as a point for 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 continued understanding and and to knowledge about the COVID issue. But we also wanted to make that connection that we are, we're in this piece together and that we know that COVID can have an impact on our our work. So we want you to be careful, be vigilant, and and be connected. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. 
Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to go over a little bit about what we're doing and, and about BAM, B-H. What is that? What does that mean? What are you guys talking about when you say BAM? This is not Superman. This is not Batman. What is BAM? BAM is break the stigma, ask for help, make the call, make the change, behavior help. We are really wanting to look at it, you know, what are these stigmas that are holding people back within our communities from accessing the treatment, for accessing the help that they really, really need, equipping them with that particular um, skill set that they will need in order to ask for help, because some of that is things that they may not even know how to do. So can you go to the next slide, please? And first, before we even go into all of this, I want to make sure that we all understand that we're on the same page about stigma. What is stigma? What does stigma mean to you? When you hear stigma, what is that? Place that in the chat. Can you go back on slide, please? Place that in the chat box for me, please, or just unmute yourself. Let's talk about this. What is stigma? What is stigma? What is stigma? Um, I believe the stigma is our beliefs, the things that we think that are going to that are going to affect us in our normal everyday life and our. Uh, the way we the, the way we see things the, 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 the way we do things that are uh, that are out of the norm for us okay okay great thank you yeah so it's kind of like you know those beliefs those set of beliefs that we were uh, brought up with those uh world views that we just kind of like know right and have um that's that's in our back pocket what else what what else how else would we define stigma what does stigma mean to you how does that look how does that feel? Please yeah. unmute your mic. Put it I'm in the chat box. Mic. Yep. Hesit hesitancy to ask for help or a fear of, of being judged. Yes. Yes, definitely. What else? When we think about, go ahead, Mr. Rachel, you, you unmuted yourself. Oh, no. I'm oh, okay. When we, when we think about stigma, and, and, and we get to the root of stigma. Stigma is the, exactly that. It is those set of beliefs that we may have been brought up with, right? Um, that we may have seen or absorbed from our community, from the people around us, from those who are in our life um, circles, right? Um, this is how we judge. This is how we see the world and this is how we treat people. Um, so those stigmas, can they be grounded in truth? Or they can be grounded in some fear, right? So you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. When we think about the actual definition or we define stigma as to um, how um, dictionary.com defines it and as well as CDC, stigma is a mark of disgrace against an identifiable group of people, right? It is um, placed on people um, for whatever reasons as we said, from those kind of world views, right, that, that people have, right? Um, it's looking at a particular quality or circumstance of that individual, not the entire totality of the individual or that group of people, just one little piece of it is what stigma looks at, right? And it is uh, generally associated with fear, a lack of knowledge, some blame or some rumors because we may not even really know the truth of the matter. And stigma can go from an individual to a group of people, to a community, to an organization, on a governmental level. So that's what we want to do. We really want to look at stigma and how those many layers of stigma impacts not just the individual who is doing self-stigmatization, self-stigmatization, or um, people who are placing a stigma on an individual, but we want to look at how it impacts not just one person, but everybody in the systems around that individual. So when we look at BAM, and when we're thinking about BAM, that first piece of break the stigma, we want to look at it. We want to define it. We want to peel back those layers of stigma. We want to get to the root cause of what's going on. And why is it even there? And how can we begin to look at it? Next slide, please. So a part of that is being able to ask for help, 
and knowing and understanding what are those resources that we that we have available for us, right? Knowing and understanding how do I even begin to ask for help? Because I was taught not to ask for help. I was taught that if I said X, Y, and Z, then that means that I am weak. But how can we break that stigma that people may be carrying that that's what happens, right? Or how can we break that stigma of people being judged about being weak or whatever that they may be dealing with, right? So we want to ask for help. We want to teach people, how do you ask for help? How do we go about that? How do we provide you with those right resources? Next slide, please. So with that, you know, asking for help, how do we even be, how can we even be able to do that when we don't know who to do, do it with? That's why we want to help them make the call. So providing the resources, connecting people into those valuable resources within the parish, right? So we know that we have some local resources. We have some national resources. We have regional resources that we connect people into. And that's what we want to do. Find those resources. Uncover those resources that are existing within the parishes that we can get people connected into so we can teach them how to get the help that they need. So first thing first is we have to identify what those uh, resources are. And we ask for the help from people in the parish. Send us those resources. Let us know who is available in your, in your parishes so that we can begin to connect people into these valuable resources at the end of the day. Next slide, please. And a part of this too, it's not just that we teach people how to make the call how to connect into resources, but also how do we make that change? How do we make that viable change? So as we already talked about, that this stigma, it can impact not just one individual, but it can also impact the family, the community, the resources that are available in the community with those organizations. People may have stigmas about organizations. Oh, I want to go to that organization because X, Y, Z. But how can we break those stigmas that people may have against organizations that have those services that they need to be able to access? So we want to talk about making that change. So taking the data that we will have based off of this town hall, based off of the surveys that we have, based off of you know other things that are already existing in the community. How can we take this data, really look at it? dissect it, look at the themes that are going on in, these, in this data that we have just now found and come up with a plan to address each of the stigmas, each of those hesitancies, each of those barriers that we have identified. How can we develop these action steps at the end of the day? And after that, we take this information, the parish members, you take this information, and now it's about seeking the the funding sources or connecting in with the right resources that may already be in existence to make the change in the parishes. This is a community level driven process, it's data driven. And so this is why these conversations are vitally important. So we're gonna continue on the conversations. This is the first of the many as we continue to develop these plans of action. So we'll have a, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but the next step to this is developing a stigma reduction plan, taking that information and developing these plans so that we can get the help that we need in the parishes. Not be a doorstop, but get the help that we need in the parishes. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So our anticipated outcomes, as I said, you know, we want to be able to identify these stigmas, identify the barriers that are holding people back. We want to equip people so that they are able to make the proper and educated decisions on who can they go to for help, how to access that help, and what is it that we need to do next. So connect them into those resources that are available. So it is uh, um, it's, it's, it's work that we are ready to roll up our sleeves and get in there and do it. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as we come together today, I am so, so excited about this amazing panel that has been put together by the Madison Parish so that we can begin to talk 
through this issue today. And um, and Ms. Beverly, I would like for you to help me introduce our amazing panelists here today. Thank you, Dr. Watch. <clears throat> It seems as if we have a diverse group of panelists this morning, and I think we're going to get a lot accomplished. And again, I'd like to say welcome, and thanks for them taking out their time this morning. But to kick things off, we're going to start with Ms. Kara jackson Ating. Kara is a licensed master social worker with 15 years of experience in clinical and community-based settings. Kara is currently serving as the Opiate Use Disorder Prevention Manager for Northeast Delta Human Service Authority's Opiate Misuse and Abuse Prevention Program, also known as OMAPP. Funded by the Louisiana State Opiate Response Federal Grant. Kara began her career as an inpatient and outpatient behavioral health social worker and later worked as a nephrology and long-term care social worker. Kara has an precocious drive in the workforce and workplace and uses her positive attitude and tireless energy in outreach and education to those in Northeast Louisiana for greater access to quality, competent mental health and addictive disorder treatments. Kara is inspired by her husband, two daughters, Micah and Michaela. In her free time, Kara likes to walk, read, spend time with her family and friends. Back to you, Dr. Watch. Thank you. Oh, I can't wait to hear from Ms. Kara. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Teratio Williams. Mr. Williams um, is 47 years old, lives in Tallulah, Louisiana, um, has been working in the mental health field for about 14 years, graduated from McCall Senior High in the class of 1991, and started his college journey at Grambling State in 92. But after three years, he ended his college journey and um, joined the military. Um, which branch of the military? I love to know my son was in the military too. Uh, but he also uh, jumped back into college in 2015, went to Capella University, where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology and went on to get his master's degree also at Capella University. Welcome, Mr. Teratio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate it, Dr. White. And I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Beverly. Thanks again, Dr. White. Amy Floyd is our next panelist. Amy is a duly licensed LCSW in Arkansas and Louisiana. She has over 20 years of experience in the fields of child and adult mental health end of life care and medical social work. She's currently managing the Tallulah and Bastrop clinics for North Delta Human Services Authority. She is in her church, very active, loves music and hopes that her work makes an impact on lives every day. Welcome aboard, Amy. Welcome, 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 welcome. So I do know we have some other Analysts, um, they, they, you know, you see them on the screen, uh, but as they join in, then we will um, introduce them to us well. Okay, so with our panelists, thank you so much for, for joining us today and um, sharing in um, your amazing experience that you have um, um, in this field. So the first question that we'd like to ask to you, um, the first question we'd like to ask you to, to the panel is what are the reasons why people experience stigma around substance abuse and mental health treatment? Uh, 
I'll start, okay. Dr. Wash, if that's okay. Oh, yes, yes ma'am. That's, that's fine. That's fine. I was just going to say, you know, the biggest thing that I see as a clinician is that people have uh, a fear about reaching out and asking for help. I think they're afraid of how others may perceive them, um, how their families or their communities, what, what their families or communities might think about them if they reach out for help. Um, and those are the things that, that I think that we can fight against as clinicians, you know, to provide education and make sure that they understand that asking for help is exactly what they need to do. Yes, great, thank you. The, the thing I've noticed is uh, that word mental. I think I said it before when we had, we had our very first meeting is that people think when they, when they say mental, the, the, the first thing that pops in their head is like, I am not crazy. The reason why I, I bring that up is, is because I had a gentleman ask me a question a couple of days ago. Actually, was I, uh, I think he's a, a substance abuse user. And I told him, I said, no, I'm not doing that, that program, but I deal with mental health. He said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to do it because I'm not crazy. And that, that, that's the first thing when, I, when, you, when you mention stigma is that in the African-American community, the first thing you say when you say mental, the, the person immediately jumps to that word that I am not crazy. To me, dealing with that, that, part, of, that, that part of mental health is, the, is really the, the hurdle that we have, that, that we face for a very long time. It's trying, it's trying to eliminate that word just thinking that just because you say what somebody mentions mental you're not we're not trying to say that you're crazy because we have a lot of people that are that have some some type of mental illness or some kind of mental disorder going on and they are actually high functioning people that deal with these disorders but then you have that then you have those people that have those mental disorders and don't actually know how to deal with them on an everyday basis it kind of affects them in a it affects their, their daily routine of life Okay. I agree to us. You know, mental health wears a lot of different hats, you know, and it's, you know, people target it to only one. Yes, I agree. And I think another issue that we don't often look at and realize is that many people in our community are not aware of how to access services. Um, so when you tie the, and that could be for a variety of other reasons. Um, socioeconomic <clears throat> status, limited transportation, um, even educational levels, not understanding um, how to access those services. And then also once they get to, maybe they know of one place um, and not to overly generalize, but let's say if they know where their um, local food stamp office is, I've gotten there and I come there and I have a variety of other issues. Um, oftentimes, those in those agencies are only addressing the need that they can provide and what those individuals have shown up for and, in, and not linking um, like the purpose of this coalition and this meeting is, is then linking them to the next um, resource it is that they need to begin to address those other issues. That, yes, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah, uh, because a lot of times if people don't know, again, it goes back to that, that whole definition of stigma, right? If you don't know, you don't have that education, um, you can't necessarily identify with what's going on with folks and being able to link them into the right resources that they need in order to um, get the proper help that they need. Hey, great, great. Does anyone else have anything else that they wanted to add to that particular question um, about the reasons why people experience stigma around substance abuse or mental health? Then we brought up some very valid reasons here. You know, people, you know, when you hear mental health, you think, I ain't crazy. Or you think mm -hmm. crazy. Or even if just a just a term therapist, treatment will give people those same kind of thought processes of. You know, I'm not crazy. I don't. I don't need help. That's that's not what I do here. You know, um, right? Yeah. And oftentimes yeah. in smaller communities, those that you're going to get help from are people you know. And so mm -hmm. I don't want. I'm going to use Teresha as an example because I remember him with, as me being a little girl. Um, so I may say, you know, I don't. I don't want to go and talk to Teresha. I don't know. You know, if he's going to tell somebody. So you have that 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 stigma that comes with it as well. And Teresha may be the 
most HIPAA abiding clinician that there is in town. But that stigma that's just related to the fact that I know these people, you know, and I can't get over that barrier um, of being able to let my guard down and go um, also to reach out for services. Right. And it's it's that's powerful. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a question for the panelists. Then that's so critical. I mean, what what Sister Kara just gave was a wonderful example. And so I asked the question: What can providers do to reduce that sort of stigma so people can access services? Um, I think I one of the you. biggest things um, is 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 being visible. Um, being out in the community, letting them know what services it, it is that you're providing. Um, you've got to be, move beyond um, what we call the traditional brick and mortar. Um, you've got to go and meet the people where they are. Um, oftentimes, um, we drive, whether it's on our way to and from work, you see people all the time that you feel like could benefit from um, some sort of service or need, whether it's, you know, food shelter. Um, and again, I don't know, everyone may not know me. I am, not only do I work for Northeast Delta, but I'm from Tallulah, born and raised. And I just think about when I was home for Thanksgiving, I drove down the street and I passed this church. And when I got to, I was going to pick up my grandmother and I said, I call her mama. She raised me. I said, mama, did you know that there's somebody sleeping on the steps um, of the church up the street? And she said, no. So we made a block so that she could see and I ended up leaving. But the next day she called, she had figured out, you know, who it was, um, what they needed, and then was trying to make sure that someone from the church connected to them to get them to someone that could help them. You know, and that's what it takes. It takes moving beyond where we traditionally conduct our business or our treatment and our services at. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Great stuff. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Ashley, uh, your hand is raised. Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I had a comment. Um, I guess I just when I was when I was listening to everybody talk, I thought about as far as the stigma um, and far as where it came about in my life. I think sometimes it deals with education because in high school, I never heard of schizophrenia, depression, or anything like that. It wasn't until I started college that I began to learn what truly what mental illness is. So I think it, if it would start at a, a earlier age, maybe like in the high, which I don't know if the curriculum has changed or not. But when I was in high school, we didn't, what we associated with mental is, is uh, peers that walked around and they displayed that something was wrong with them. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't until, like I said, I started college that I was kind of introduced and said, okay, what really is mental illness? And also when I started working with mental illness, people that had the, these diagnoses, I was able to break the stigma that was like, okay, some of these people are, are normal people. I see them every day. They look normal. But I was able to see them when they were on medication, when they were not on medication. So I think if it starts at an earlier age, that might help with breaking the stigma. Well, that's that's a that's an excellent point, Miss Ashley, um, because a lot of times, you know, young people we don't understand. I'm going to say weak. I'm still young. Yeah. Um, I don't understand, you know, exactly what uh, what, you know, what stigma is or even what some of these behavioral health. Um, components are right because we just kind of oh they oh they doing that they crazy y'all uh oh, you know look at so and so so and so um and, and point fingers I think that that's that's one of the beauties of now um things have been changing and shifting so much um in our society now that we have you know the mental health first day you know that kind of teaches you those foundations about what mm -hmm. the different types of mental health um, illnesses or challenges that people may deal with that are out there. Um, and then they also have it for um, youth, mental health first aid for youth. And being able to bring something like that to the table where people can begin to um, come to some awareness about, you know, how does this look in young people? Um, I know that I've shared, I don't know if I shared it with this particular group or with, um, with another um, parish implementation team, I, I shared that, you know, I, 
I experienced, um, you know, people in my family dealing with mental health um, related issues. You know, at a, at a very young age, I had a cousin that committed suicide. Um, he was six, but he had dealt with so many different mental health issues um, up to that particular point in time that, you know, he needed those voices to stop. But had someone been able to really recognize, other people been able to recognize, you know, the things that he was dealing with and going through and um, really got him the help and continue to get him that intensive help that he needed, um, it, it would have made a much better life for him. Uh, Ms. Ross, I saw that you had your hand raised. Yes, you know, getting back to um, the occurrence that Kara uh, experienced while being here in Tulula. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very good information that she put out there for us. But I, I know I always say that there are times, you know, when we see people and when the right people approach them in the correct manner, they tend to accept help and guidance, you know, a bit better. You know, sometimes we have to, I think, break it down a little bit and not, you know, come on so forceful, you know, to the people and they will welcome you and you'll be able to help provide them with some of the resources or the treatment, you know, that they need, which will help us rise above everything. That was it. Great. Thank uh, you. I also go off what uh, Ms. Etienne was saying when it comes to like, like a lot of people, and, and she was correct, uh, she's uh, correct about the fact that they're afraid to come to the people because they, because you are in the same community. Like, uh, I have a lot of people that, uh, I used to work with uh, in the Lake Providence area and clients they wanted to sign up and say, well, there is, we do have an office here in Lake Providence. They say, well, I don't want to go there because those people uh, know my business. They are afraid that somebody's going to go out there and tell what's going on. They are afraid that, that, that uh, uh, the first thing you're going to say, uh, you're going to be in my business. I mean, be in your business. I mean, you got somebody that's trying to actually help you. Forget about what you know about this individual. And, and it, it all to me, it all begins with trust. Trusting an individual and, be, and being able to express yourself in a way is going to show the person that you are there to help them and not and not hurt them. Yes, exactly, exactly. That trust, that trust is very big. Trust and confidentiality. Yes, that's that's very big. You know, when we think about you know young people and not just young people, but people in general trying to access treatment and and help from other people. Yes, so. What are those stigmas that are related to treatment that we hear or see around um, this issue within the Madison Parish? What are some of those stigmas that we hear or see? The, the, the big thing is confidentiality. Somebody's going to go tell my business. Okay. I also think, um, like we said, um, identifying resources. Um, and then lack of resources. Um, yeah. Tulula is a very small town. Madison Parish is a very small town. Um, and so there's not any one particular place that could possibly meet all the needs um, or even the gaps in services or how, you know, if I'm being treated here for one thing, um, if I have certain coverage, then I can't receive services or treatment over here, and that particular issue may be just as important as what I'm at, at Agency X for um, to begin with. Um, and I think also not talking about um, the issues that are in the community, not being willing to address and say that these are issues that we're having in the community. Um, like I said, a lot of times when I go and I do the Narcan trainings and I try to explain not just what Narcan is, but what's the, the purpose and how it benefits the community. Um, I can't tell you how many times people say, well, that's not an issue that we're having here in our area. Um, and I'll say, you know, it isn't. And I'm, I have access to the data. Um, I'm, I see and I know. And then not only access to the data. But again, also being from that town, I'm friends with a lot of people and you see what goes on and you hear about things um, through friends and family and social media. And you do know that it is an issue that is going on in the community. So denial is another part of it. 
yes, 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 yes. That is that is big. That is big. Okay. So let me, so let me ask you all this question. If you can um go um uh, when we think about what's going on and we think about, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, all those different factors, you know, when we think about the diversity will itself, right? Um, how does that affect the stigma associated with people accessing treatment? I think oftentimes because people self-stigmatize, um, they're already fighting that battle of, do I talk about what's going on with my mental health? Mm -hmm. Can I trust anyone that I can talk to about what's happening? And then the other issues may layer another, just, just add another layer of concern for them. Okay, can I talk to someone about the fact that I'm struggling with my sexuality? Can I talk to anyone about the fact that I don't feel comfortable in my own skin? You know, all of those things are happening. I think it just adds layer upon top of layer of the stigma they're already feeling. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I think also with um, the part you said about race, um, I think we also have to be um, honest and cognizant of the fact that um, Tallulah is still pretty much, you can say, divided. Um, I graduated from there in 1998 and I graduated from an all black high school. Um, and so then even later on, when the schools decided to merge in 2005, there was a mass busing. And that's still going on today, um, where I think the per population uh, percent the, the racial dynamic, even in our school system, is still 99 percent black um, that where we have almost 10 buses coming in and busing our children outside of, and I'm saying our children because even though I don't live there anymore, I, that's home um, being bussed out. And so that is still a very, race plays a very big part um, in that mm -hmm. and not being able to come together. It's looked at as a, this is an issue that is taking place on that side of town and, and both ways. Um, because again, we all know that various drugs um, affect are more popular among certain um, populations and demographics. Um, what we're finding, though, with the opioid epidemic is that that's not the case. It's affecting us all. Age, race, sex, color, it's affecting us all the same. However, when we talk about it and when you're sitting and trying to identify what those issues are, it's viewed as a that's their problem or that's what goes on on that side of town. Um, I can remember growing up that if we saw someone um, of a certain race on our side of town, we automatically said they were over there to buy drugs. I mean, that's how divided it is. And I think that that's something that to really start making a change, we've got to we've got to address that. We've, we've, we've have, we have to acknowledge that and we have to figure out how to bring everyone together because the effects that it is having on the community is, uh, is impacting everyone, whether it's with um, the sc school system, whether it's with um, property value, jobs, all of those things. It is playing a major role. And until everyone can put them and they aside and come together, um, we're gonna still be spinning the wheel. Oh, yes, that is so important, Ms. Cara, um, with what you said, because a lot of times we often do forget that we still have that small thing. Well, not really, not small, but we have that thing in anti racism, and people yes. still kind of play on that. You know, there's still division, or maybe if it's not division, we still have those unconscious thoughts, biases that we have among people that we are. Um, working with, or that we may even see in the community, right? And that, and that can come up, that can come about and impact the things that we see, um, or how we treat people, right? Because if other people are thinking that, um, hey, they're over there making a drug trade or what have you, and not really thinking about, oh, they can just be trying to talk and help one another, yes, or yes. you know, you automatically riding through and you <laughs> pushing down that, you know, that. Uh, that lock my doors and roll up my windows 
syndrome, but not really understanding and giving people the, the, the chance because you just don't understand the environment. So that's Correct. something that's, that's, that's really, really key. Go ahead, Tracy. Dr. Weiss and, and all, I mean, it seems like Sister uh, Carol has, has brought up something that um, is, is, it, is it the elephant in the room uh, as it relates to the conversation about rising above stigma, especially in our in our Madison parish? Is that an, is that the elephant similar to do you uh, does other panelists have a, a thought about that conversation uh, What what that point that Sister Kyra brought up? It, it, I mean, it's a major issue because because um, what I find out doing just actually doing this job is just like majority of the clients that uh, that, that, that are actually involved in our uh, in the program that I've been involved in have actually been African American, and uh, most times uh, I've had I've worked with coworkers when they come in they are actually licensed therapists when our Caucasian or other races come in and they actually speak with that licensed person that is white they're figuring that. The person that's going to come see them is going to be of that of that same race. And when they find out that the therapist that's going to actually come out to the house to actually work with them is of of, of another race, the first thing they will say, "I no longer want services," and they they, they have no problem expressing, "Well, I don't want this." I, me, I, I'm a blood person, so I'm just going. I don't want that black man or that black woman coming to my house. I've also had work with licensed therapists. Like, ooh, they went to a, a house and spoke with a I, I can say uh, a black a, a black female in the house, and as soon as we left the house, I don't know I no longer want to go back to that house. So that that's something that that's something else in this area that we have to get past because there are people of different races working in it, and that that's something that we have to work with being being diverse and being able to work with every person on on and being getting past that bias, getting past that discrimination, being able to work with that person because. You genuinely want to help that individual be successful in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's 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 great, and that's real key, uh, Mr. Terracio, as to what you brought up. Real key. Yes. Are there any other um, comments or, or questions about um, about that question that we just talked about? Any other food for thought? I love the comments that, that both Kara and uh, Ratio mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fairly new to Tallulah, so I'm still learning about the environment there. But um, I, 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 I echo those sentiments in that I hope that when people do seek out services, what we can see is the humanness in them, <laughs> um, not to glaze over the differences that we have because we all have differences but I hope that we can sometimes place those aside or acknowledge them and address them and then move forward with the fact that we're trying to just help other people. And so I hope that that's the way that we can approach that. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Amy. Okay. Thank you. We can go to the next slide, please. Because we want to know what's going on. I know we kind of talked about this a little bit, but I want to be able to have a little bit more of a conversation about what's going on. What are we seeing? What are we hearing in the community? Yes, 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 yes. We want to know. We want to know what is going on in the community. What's going on in the parish? In the chat, I have dropped a link for a... Um, for, for a Google document and uh, wanna, you know, just ask these questions. And I'm, and I'm gonna ask Ms. Uh, Beverly to help me um, go through this process, but we wanna know what is going on. So why do you think, and I know we had some of this conversation already, but please um, get this, uh, go ahead and access the Google doc and let's type on it and I'll share it and you can, we can have a conversation and other people can type on it. Uh, but what do you think or why do you think that people in your parish hesitate to receive the mental health treatment services? Why do you think that people in your parish hesitate to receive the mental health services?
Okay, so we see, you know, some people have on here small town issues. There's a lack of trust. What else? And then we had some, some very rich conversation already about this. Unmute your mics. Place things in the chat. Racism, okay. Confidentiality. Confidentiality might be an issue. Yes, yes, yes. What else? Not being knowledgeable of actually what's available here in the parish, you know, for a lot of people. You know, when I was viewing that video and I looked at the the people in the army fatigue, uh, the camouflage, mm -hmm. I thought about years ago when we would see people and they'd say, as a ratio, say they'd say, oh, he's crazy. Not knowing that this person had actually been to the military and suffered and came back because of some mental illness. And they're not being, they don't know where to get resources. You know, it's out there, but everybody's not always in contact with the right person. And if they are shy, then, you know, they've just, they're, they're withdrawn. And we, as a community, sometimes just look at them and push them you know, give them this stigma, just push them to the side and they just suffer and suffer and suffer. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe with more communication, you know, out there, not just within the, the meetings like we're doing now, but when you see someone, talk to them, talk to, you know, with your, your peers, you know, because someone might know someone. Mm -hmm. And also there can be also be a lack of professionalism. Because some people they, they claim to, to actually know the job, they actually don't know because they they, they lack professionalism and what they're supposed and what they're actually supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to help others. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, challenge challenges in the faith community. Uh, somebody type that in. Um, yeah, I mean, there there could be some challenges within the faith community. And, and, and what do we mean by that? Let's talk about that just a little bit, because I know as uh, as as a as a faith leader, uh, there there were some challenges in the faith community when we wanted to talk about mental health and substance abuse. Um, you know, but I'd like to hear from you all. What were some of those or what are some of those challenges that, that may be in existence? Um, I think part of it could be that maybe there's not really um, a lot of churches or many churches that are taking on the role in, in the community and helping to um, either address the problem or taking on a role of being a link to services. Um, I think about more often than not, um, a lot of times um, when people are either returning home from um, treatment or either um, even incarceration. A lot of times church is the first place that they're going to um, because they have that renewed sense of faith um, and, and that commitment to remaining on um, track. And so what role does the church play in making sure that they're connected to and following up on all of their discharge planning um, that they've received once they've um, come out? So I think that could be one of the things that um, that person is implying um, in challenging in, in the faith community. Mm -hmm. And then I've been able to identify um, what faith community, what what is churches that you can go to in order to receive help. Good, good, good. Is it a member only um, service you know what i'm saying like you know do we only assist those who are actual who hold membership in our church yeah because that's because 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 that is important you know being able to understand you know kind of just go beyond just the membership of the church because a lot of times people um you know they they may not think that you know i'm not a member of the church so i can't go there for help, or right. maybe sometimes those are some of those stipulations within that particular um, church or that congregation. Yes, yes, yes. Right. And I think sometimes too, and this may be another elephant coming out, but I think sometimes, a lot of times, some of us in the church can be very stigmatizing. 
Um, Mm -hmm. We can be very judgmental um, a lot of times because we may think that, you know, it's simply about praying and that all you have to do is pray and and everything is going to be okay. And I understand that for some people, that's just not always the case. Yes, yes. And that's and that's important. That's important, you know, to understand that and to know that a lot of times, you know, for for people, it's not just about that prayer. And it doesn't mean that because I need to go seek outside help for this substance abuse addiction or this mental health um, challenge that I might be struggling with. It doesn't mean that I have dwindled on my faith. It doesn't mean that I am weak. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Now, 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 now I'm going somewhere <laughs> else. I'm so, so sorry, y'all. But that is so important that we got to make sure that we understand that and call out that elephant in the living room when we talk about that, or should I say, call out that elephant that's inside a sanctuary, right? Because we have to understand and know that we still need to um, get those services because sometimes it's not that easy for some people to just say, you know what? I prayed about it. I laid that, that bottle on the altar and God took that thing away from me and I was okay. Because sometimes it takes a little bit more than just that for people. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm so sorry. I won't. I, 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 you know, I want to hear from you guys. Okay, so when we think about these challenges and, and why people hesitate to receive the services for mental health treatment, um, why, you know, why do people hesitate to receive, or why do you think people hesitate to receive the services for substance abuse? If you can scroll down to the to question number two, why do you think that people hesitate to receive the services for substance abuse treatment? And some of these may be duplicate, right, responses, but some of them could be a little bit different. Uh, some people um, hesitate because uh, the the lack of uh, 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 treatment, uh, the way they're treated, uh, uh, even on their jobs, uh, fear of losing their jobs, uh, fear of uh, the livelihood that they they uh, uh, that they'll you know once had and, and have now, uh, and it's just a prejudice uh, towards uh, people uh, in general when when the, when it comes to. Uh, that particular uh, subject for people with with mental illness uh, is just you know they deal with a lot of discrimination uh, even in the workforce uh, they just deal with a lot of discrimination and prejudice uh, when it comes to mental illness and that's one reason uh, people don't like to come forward uh, because of that. Okay. What else? What are some other reasons? Why people hesitate. Thank you so much, because those are very, very valid, you know, because people are thinking, you know, if I go and get this help, I go and get this treatment, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, lose my job. You know, I'm not going to be able to keep up with the livelihood that I have going on right now. Um, you know, there there could be some discrimination in the workforce. That is that is so true. How many times do you see people shun away from people who are, um, you know, struggling with an addiction? We ain't even in a workforce. Right. We ain't even in the mm-hmm. workforce. I have family members who struggle with addiction and family members didn't even want to go nowhere near them. Nowhere near them. Just because they had an addiction and not understanding what addiction is and, and the process that that it, uh, that an individual goes through when they're dealing with their addictions. OK. And, okay. Uh, yeah. That's because of denial. That I, mm-hmm. A lot of people don't admit that. Oh, I got to. Oh, I can stop anytime I get ready. I can stop. Uh, it, it, it's not a big issue. It's not a problem. I, I, I've, I've handled it before. I've done it before, and I've stopped before. They don't. I, I, I think that, that what she put that denial is, is, is also a very big issue of admitting to addiction and uh, uh, mental health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So denial that that is a big one. As well as I see in the chat box, and I did transpose it over here, is that substance abuse is normalized in families, right, or in the, or in the culture. What what does that mean when we think about it being normalized? How do we normalize it? What does that mean? Can you oh, scroll cool. down on the um, on the on the screen, please? I'm oh, sorry. Like that, like that. Okay, marijuana. Oh, marijuana is cool. It, uh, everybody smokes it. It, uh, it's, it's a natural herb. It's uh, it's, it's from the it's, it's from the uh, the, the earth. earth. 
<laughs> that's, that's the belief that everybody's always been told that it's it's normal to do that. Mm-hmm. And like uh, and obviously, is it like alcohol? Alcohol to me, I think alcohol is actually the gateway drug that the gateway substance that, that everybody starts with. It goes from alcohol to marijuana to something that's uh, just a little bit stronger, something to kind of help you deal with what's going on with with you uh, emotionally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I think another stigma is is blame. It's trying to identify when someone, especially when it comes to addiction, um, and that addiction has gotten to the point where that person it's controlling almost every aspect of their life. A lot of times the people around them look to see as a way, instead of helping the individual, as a way to ease or comfort themselves, who do we blame for this? Whose fault is this? Um, looking to see well, who, who gave them the drug or who, who introduced them to it? Um, and, or it's your fault as to why. Um, so there's a blame game as opposed to um, just acknowledging the issue or the problem and then, you know, seeking the services or treatment. Great, great, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, are there any other challenges or barriers, you know, that, um, causes people to hesitate to receive a substance abuse treatment services that they may need. I think another one is uh, where uh, the the individual uh, think uh, they think themselves that they can do uh, uh, this they can do uh, this treatment themselves by not even seeking uh, the help that they really need, and they really think that okay, I started this this type of uh, uh, behavior, and I can uh, come off this, 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 this type of behavior myself, uh, because they, they believe that they can put, it, uh, put this thing uh, to rest on their own. And it's very hard uh, for them. And, and that's why I continue, continue, and continue to go on and on, because, um, because they don't seek the help that they need. They don't educate themselves on, on the things that they need. And so many people uh, just go after uh, uh, the, pe- the, the person with the mental illness and they don't uh, even want to even be involved in trying to get treatment. Uh, and it's very hard for them. And I, I, I think it's just uh, the educating uh, these people, uh, the, the ones that with the mental Ill- illness, uh, just educate them so they can go out and get that help that they need. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Antonio. Um, um, and, and I'm going to place this on up here. I promise I didn't pay him to go on to this next portion of this. Because the next portion of this is what are the solutions, right? What do we think? What are some of those suggestions that we can provide to people um, in order to move them from being hesitant to get those treatment services to actually um, obtaining treatment services? So if you can go to the flip back over, go to the next slide. Because um, we're going to go on and go to this portion about solutioning, right? Okay. Um, what do you think of some of the solutions? Oh, it's going on. Go ahead, Ms. Ross. Okay. What are some of the solutions to addressing the hesitations of people actually obtaining the mental health treatment services that they need? What What are some of the solutions that you think can be brought on? Okay. Well, I think that... Um, Primarily, the first, one of the first steps is kind of what we're doing here today um, and what we've been doing now for um, the past several weeks is meeting to identify um, what the issue is um, and coming up with um, identifying those things that are specific to Madison Parish and Tallulah um, specifically because what's going on in Madison Parish may look different in other parishes. And so using data-driven and key community people in addressing that issue. 
um, outreach, prevention, education, um, content, saturating the community um, with resources, um, lists of resources that's available. Um, and when I say community, I mean in law enforcement, school, school board members, um, church. You know, it, it's going to take a key community effort, a community effort from a lot of various community stakeholders in being able to bring forth um, the solutions mm -hmm. and start addressing and impacting change. Yes. Okay, Kara, so you're saying that it's going to take, as the old saying, it's going to take the whole village. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Great, thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, Go I, ahead. Think, I think uh, comfortability is, is, is very important, uh, along with education. Uh, before we get to education, we have to make that individual comfortable uh, with communication, uh, with all sorts of things that we need to uh, have them to be comfortable with. Because if an individual isn't comfortable with um, talking or speaking, uh, we can't get uh, where we need to get with that individual. So comfort comfortability is very, very, very important. Mm, that, that, that is so important. That is so important. I, I, I need to just echo how important that is because I've heard that in different areas that, you know, being able to be comfortable with the people that you talk with because of, you know, the building of trust and, and, and you've gotten to know me as an individual before I have divulged all of my personal information out to you, right? Because not everybody's an open book. So, yes, yeah, so we, we have to make sure that, you know, that comparability is there. And that's, that's, that's really key. Yeah. What just else? To, and, go ahead. Just to piggyback off of those, definitely um, compassionate communication. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's really easy to tell someone that you're going to care, but when you show them is when they really get that. And mm -hmm. so being compassionate in every interaction that you have with someone um, so that you can, you know, teach them that you are a safe place to express whatever needs that they may have. Mm -hmm. yeah, be that safe place. Exactly. Um, I do see that um, actually put in here some individualized services whenever possible, being able to provide that to folks. Right, you get out to that to that drill down level of the individual and what they need and really understanding what they need. What else? This is this is good, y'all. I'm getting so excited. This is good. What else? What about? Go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Weiss. What about what's the solution? As I look over here, we're looking at on one side of the wall some of the problem challenges and barriers you all mentioned. So what is, what's the solution? For example, we have on one side, the challenges, uh, faith community, church is not taking on the role of addressing the services or understanding of the role of the faith. Any solutions does anyone have? And I see in the chat box, build on strengths in the community. Yes, I love that. Well said, Miss Ashley. Well said. What are some other solutions? Any solutions that you all see? Uh, what about with law enforcement? What are some solutions you all may have? Well, I, with law enforcement, I think um, law enforcement has a, a, a big role in this uh, by um, making the, 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 the client, the patient uh, feel comfortable as well, because uh, when a person has a mental illness, uh, they kind of shy away from everybody. They isolate themselves from, from, from the world and they, they live in their own uh, community. And we have to make sure that even law, when law enforcement do get involved, uh, to make sure that law enforcement can treat them in a proper manner so they can, you know, they, they are comfortable making sure that law enforcement is not, uh, is really trying to help, not hurt, uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that law enforcement uh, understand and law enforcement needs to be trained on these types of behavior because uh, these, type, these types of behavior we see often uh, on TV all the time where a person may have mental illness 
and law enforcement, uh, you know, drive them down, beat them or whatever uh, you, you see out in the communities now. Uh, but we have to have more training, even when with law enforcement, because um, it's just needed. A lot of training is needed uh, in all areas of our, our uh, 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 in all areas uh, to make this happen uh, as a whole for our entire nation. And I have a follow up with that, Mr. Wilson. So yeah. does do, does law enforcement know, say, if there's a mental health crisis, do they know, do they have the resources and know where to take the client or the individual? Most most law enforcement sometimes have resources if they've been trained on it. Uh, but we find in so many uh, municipalities and, and state governments uh, and state uh, uh, law enforcement that most of them have, haven't been trained on these types of behavior. They don't know how to recognize these types of behavior. When you have people like this, you have to recognize that behavior. Uh, uh, some law enforcement, they go out and, and, and see these, uh, uh, these issues and, and they think the behavior is uh, erratic and, you know, and they wanna go out and, and, and just, you know, just do what they do normally and not recognize the behavior. And that's a lot of things that we, we have going on in our, in our world because we, don't, we have to learn how to recognize these types of things. Antonio, you brought up a good point there. So what do you think, do you think the community should, I don't want to demand or ask that law enforcement be trained? Because when a family member calls someone because of an issue with that somebody's in there, someone's in their family suffer from uh, a mental illness or substance abuse that when they arrive on the scene that they are knowledgeable of the next step to take, or if it's only one person that, if that's the case, to try and contact that particular person that's in law enforcement and have them to actually meet them there. What do you think the community need to say to law enforcement to get this, you know, so they'll become aware. Well, the, the community as a whole, uh, but it, it also comes from leadership as well, uh, from the top down from Washington, D.C., all the way down to the lower municipalities, where you have to, that, that should be driven uh, for more training to recognize, uh, to uh, for families to get involved. If they know uh, that their family member has a, 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 a mental health issue, uh, law enforcement should be, you know, you should have some type of record saying, look, my, my, uh, my family member has a mental health issue. It may be some times where I may need to call uh, law enforcement to get involved because I can't handle the behavior. So when that, those types of things happen, it should be a record. So when law enforcement or either fire department or, or paramedics or whomever come, and see about this particular individual, we have record, we know how to treat uh, this person. Uh, we know how, uh, what, what behaviors uh, we need to have, but we have to get training in law enforcement. That's, that's a key. Training is necessary for law enforcement to recognize these type of behavior. Thank you. And we got Ashley and then Kara. Miss Ashley? Um, th this is just a resource for law enforcement if they're not getting the training. They do have something called crisis intervention training specifically for law enforcement officers for the Northeast region. I don't know if um, Madison Paris send their officers to this training that's done yearly. Also, a resource is if you have a family member that has like a mental illness, then you're supposed to be able to request that they send a CIT certified officer. So I don't know if this is a resource that you guys are aware of. Um, and it's just, you know, and, and it's not being utilized, but that is a resource that you can tap into. It's called the uh, Northeast Delta Crisis Intervention Training Team. And they do provide that type of training to law enforcement, specifically for law enforcement. Now, another thing that I, I could kind of share some input in because I, I have worked in law enforcement and it does need to be some training because the number one thing that an officer has to deal with when they arrive is safety. That's the first thing they're going to deal with is safety. That's just their training, safety. 
So if you do have someone that's having a manic episode, the first thing they're going to want to deal with is safety compliance. And then trying to get compliance only makes the situation worse. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's a resource that you can use. And that's also building on your strength because if it's a small community, everybody should know everybody. And you probably get the same officer coming out. So that, that's a strength that I think that you guys can build on. Thank you, Ashley. Kara. Yes, um, I agree with what Ashley and Antonio said completely. Um, I think as it relates to um, what we're doing here um, and now with this meeting, um, I think it's important that um, they have a seat at this table, um, that there should be someone from law enforcement here with us. Um, faith community members should also be. I know um, Pastor Johnson is on um, and so maybe that's something that one of our strategies could be is to start. And it doesn't mean that by the next meeting we would have anyone. Um, and, it may, and we may. Um, but I think starting to educate them and reaching out directly to them and letting them know, um, not just in an email, but what this group is, what, what the purpose is for and how it can work and, and go hand in hand with what they're doing in protecting and serving our community. Yes, yes, yes. That's great. Um, we're having some great discussion. And again, I know some of these same solutions that we had up here for the um, behavioral health or mental health also transposes down here for solutions for substance abuse treatment. How can we, or what are some of those solutions that we can think about that may be able to help people obtain those um, treatment services that they need for substance abuse addictions. And it's okay if it's duplicate, if you, you know, say the same thing <laughs> that you said before, it's totally okay. Because yeah, you I, do know, like what you said, Ms. Carr, those, those coalitions, right? <laughs> People coming to the table from all 12 sectors of the community, it's yes. important to address these issues. We want to have yes. them at the table, Right. Yes. So what else? Yes. What, what else? I'm going to just transpose that down here anyway. <laughs> you didn't okay. say it again, but I'm going to transpose that down here anyway. Right. What else I, do we I, want to hear? I think it also, again, is um, being aware of the resources. Um, and I'm going to use this as an example. Miss Amy is managing the Tallulah Clinic. They may not know in Tallulah that Miss Amy is managing the Northeast Delta Clinic. There is not an inpatient treatment facility in Tallulah. However, Northeast Delta partners with one in Ravel. Do you see what I'm saying? So understanding that you can still access services that's not necessarily right there in the community, but through an agency that is there and be connected to the treatment that you need. Um, so it, that, that again goes back to educating the community on what's available to them. Um, and not just that it's there, but knowing, okay, what insurance do they accept? Um, what in, and, and also knowing that, okay, if I don't have insurance, that I can still go and see Miss Amy and she's going to provide me with some sort of, you know, with service or treatment or connect me to one that can. Um, I think that's the biggest the biggest thing is, and we, we can be prepared with being, um, with confidentiality, with compassionate quality care, but they won't get any of that if they don't know what services are available. Right, right. That's, that's, that's important. Thank you so much. So how can we make sure that people understand those connections in that process? Is there anything that, you know, that, that maybe we can, can do as we kind of like, through these solutions and uh, you know is there anything that we can do to kind of help that process along for people to understand I think someone mentioned earlier being visible in the community I think that's very important one of the things that I'm trying to do to understand the community <laughs> is to kind of get a handle on what's where where do people you know live and hang out where do they do their business you know those kind of things mm -hmm. so I think it's very important for any provider to be active in that community to be visible in that community 
And I think a way to reach the community also, um, I think a lot of times we don't realize it, is through our schools, um, providing some information um, and working with the superintendent and the principals and saying, hey, you know, we have an infograph that we want to get out. And is it okay that we send it home? We're going to provide everything. We just need you to get it to your students so that they can take it home. Um, a lot of times that opens the door and gets you inside of homes at a much faster pace, um, as opposed to just having something set in a specific area um, in the community. And piggybacking off of that information that was just provided, we, uh, we do have uh, some school counselors here in Tallulah, as far as uh, Mr. Foster uh, at, the elementary, uh, at the elementary level, uh, Ms. Rebels at the junior high level, Dr. Carlzetta Redden at the high school level, they, 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 they are good resources as providing reference, references to the agencies for mental health here in Tallulah. But the thing is, actually getting the parents to actually walk through the door and accepting those services. Because you got a lot of parents for thinking, well, my child, my child, this, my child, that, my child doesn't need that. Not understanding that most kids, they're going to behave one way at home, but when they get to the school around their peers, there's a total, there's a total different reaction of be, well, what's being raised. They, we have to have a lot of parental involvement in the school because that's something that we do not have here in this area, a lot of parental involvement in the school district. They want to come down there when the kid is, uh, when the, the person is, they're not coming down there for the grades. The, the first thing you want to do is, uh, well, my uh, a, a fight or behavior, then they want to come down and act a fool with their children. That's something that we have to get away from then in this community. Being able to accept the help that's being offered to you. Do you think, Mr. Williams, that is there an issue with the approach or how it's come about? Um, because I've seen that, oh, so many times across the country. And so do mm -hmm. you think it's about the approach? And, and be, because I've, I've heard it where, you know, my, my son, my oldest son, he's a uh, highly functional MR with a schizophrenia diagnosis. I have been through this. And so is it the way that it's taught or told to the parent? Oh, I need you to see a mental health therapist, or is it like um, we would love for you and your child to speak to someone? You know, as we know, COVID, we're just coming out of COVID, and everyone has experienced some trauma. You see the difference, or do, does that play a part in it? Do you think it does? Especially that word, like we said earlier about the word being mental and the word being therapist, because they feel as though that we don't need that. That's that again. That's that stigma that we got to get past of saying that, hey, you have somebody here that's willing to help you deal with those issues. So we get, if, if, if we can eliminate, eliminate that stigma about actually receiving the help, it will, mm -hmm. it will benefit the community greatly. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, you being in the education realm, mental therapy realm, what do you think is a good approach then, the solution for that to where, we can have that family engagement to where the parent is open to the child receiving services or the adult or the family. Actually, actually basically pretty much explaining them. You, you, you have to, you have to break it down to them. I'll mm -hmm. just say, I, I hate to say this, but you just kind of, I mean, just get on their level with it. Don't try to go in there like, uh, I'm a doctor, this, I'm a doctor. I'm going to, no, you, you have to explain it to them to a way that they're going to understand and, and receive it on a way that's going to make sure it's going to be it's going to benefit them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else like to add to that? Yeah. I think it's really good dialogue. I mean, this is really, really good dialogue, but we all have to look at uh, our, our, our parenting uh, uh, skills that we ha all have here on this on this um, on this call here. Um, it's hard for a parent, uh, as me as a parent, if it will be hard for me to uh, hear someone uh, that possibly wasn't trained properly, uh, that may could be uh, telling me something in an aggressive manner, or or a manner that I couldn't accept uh, that my 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 child has some type of mental illness. Um, it's very important how you how you approach. Uh, and it goes back to what you're saying, uh, 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 
Mr. Williams, uh, the approach is very, very important. Uh, when you approach an individual, and sometimes we may diagnose something and, 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 and it not be that. Uh, uh, we have to uh, maybe get some type of, you know, doctor involved at, at school doctor or school nurse or uh, the counselors, uh, uh, you know, being able to, you know, break that, that hard news that, you know, it's a possibility your child has, you know, a mental illness um, issue. And it, that's a hard pill for a parent uh, to actually swallow and understand and uh, comprehend at the time that, you, you know, you, you having this dialogue with them. Uh, so we, as parents, we have to come and figure out how can, you know, and it has to be a standard across the board, not just, uh, you know, I'm going to do here in Madison Parish, Richmond Parish, I'm going to do this, Washington Parish, I'll do another thing. It has to be a standard across the board uh, uh, here in the state of Louisiana uh, to make it, you know, everybody has that same standard. So nobody could be, you know, thinking they're discriminated against, uh, thinking they're, uh, that, oh, you're picking on my child because you, you don't like my child, uh, because all sorts of things just come out of your head when you're trying to break something down to a person that you love the most. Mm. That, is, that is so important. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Wilson, for, sh for sharing that and bringing that to the table, because a lot of times, um, you know, we do forget about how that comes across to a parent, right? I mean, because as a parent of two, my son um, was going through, um, you know, different things in high school and and, and we finally got the diagnosis um, that he was suffering from uh, depression, suicide and, um, ideation and an anxiety disorder. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is what did I do wrong? What are you trying to say that I did as a parent that caused this with my child? And I'm a, I'm a good parent, right? Um but I had to take that step back in understanding and knowing no matter how much education I had, how many years I've been in the field of behavioral health and mental health, when it came down to my child, that was personal, right? So, so yes, we have to think about those things and how we are um, pulling them forth those messages and saying it to other people, right? Um, for, for parents to understand. So that's standard. That's, that's, that's important. I put that on both both ends, the substance abuse treatment and that mental health treatment, you know, understanding and developing a standard approach of um, being able to talk with not just parents, but also other providers, right? Were you, you going to say something, Ms. Beverly? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I think Ms. Raylette is really just into everything that's going on. And because after speaking with her here in Tallulah, I, you know, I, I know of her, her passion for this. And I think uh, she's, she's doing a real good job of letting us know, you know, that she's on board and, you know, she understands what could possibly be going on here in Tallulah compared to things that have happened in other areas, you know, that's, and I think that's going to help us, you know, a lot. And, you know, I know she has a strong urge for doing this type of work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Teresia, were you going to say something? Yeah, actually, when you, uh, when you uh, express yourself about mental illness to some of these parents, don't just go, go out there throwing out these acronyms, ADHD, ODD, OD. You have to explain to them actually what, what that it is. is. Yes. And sometimes, uh, as a licensed person, as what I'm learning now is that pull out that DSM-5 and just kind of just go out there and explain exactly what ADHD is, what ODD is. Don't just just don't throw those acronyms out to those people because they they don't they don't understand what you they actually don't understand what you're saying because the, again the DSM five it kind of breaks it down to each mental disorder about what's going on what are what are the what are the uh, the criteria what does your child fall into because sometimes again I think somebody said uh, during this meeting is that you can't be misdiagnosed with certain things because mm -hmm. it may not be ADHD it may not be ODD it may be like just Hey, I, I just had a moment, and let, 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 let's take it from there. And it may not be as severe as you think it is. Mm -hmm. You must just throw those acronyms out to people. Explain to them what's going actually 
what, what actually what you're saying if you're gonna uh try to uh, diagnose it with a, a mental disorder exactly exactly yes 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 that that is so key and so important that we have to make sure that you know we're still being human in the process a lot of times we take out that humanistic component of it which is just that basic understanding and explaining what we're actually talking about um you know, so yeah that's 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 very very key thank you Thank you. And I did add that to the list too as well. What else? What are some other things that we need to um, consider or, or think about? Are there any other pieces that we want to add to this list? I want to echo <clears throat> what Mr. Wilson said about uh, primary care providers and nurses and doctors being involved uh, with those families. Sometimes um, our families have a very strong connection <clears throat> and a, and a, sometimes a long connection with people who are providing primary care to them in, in their lives. And that can be an excellent uh, resource for you in trying to establish that rapport, trying to make sure that they understand that you're not trying to just, you know, throw a diagnosis at their child or try to, you know, take out of context what's going on. Um, that primary care provider oftentimes can be kind of a bridge to help you reach that family. Um, I have been in a setting where we had a primary care provider in the school system and I was a behavioral health provider that would work with that primary care. And it was an excellent uh, partnership and we were able to really sometimes break down walls that maybe I, I wouldn't have been able to do if I was working on my own. Yes, yes, great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I did put that on here too, you know, making sure that we have you know, those primary cares involved because that is vitally important um, because they can help with some of those things that we've already talked about, right? Providing those resources and actually, you know, helping to break down things. Providing is the right primary care provider, but we but we do need them involved, you know, because they, they manage that care of that individual um, from beginning to end. Yes, yes. So, so key and so important. I think that we're having a very rich conversation. Um, and, you know, we just need to remember the conversation doesn't stop here. It's not going to just, just stop here with this one day, with, with this, um, you know, one particular time frame that we have together. Before we move on, are there any other, um, you know, comments that we want to make or questions that we want to ask before we move on from this particular piece of identifying uh, some of those solutions to the hesitations to getting people the treatment that they need. Dr. Watch, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but prior to, um, what is it, Northeast Delta Human Services in Tallulah, I can remember that office was held in a doctor's story was a physician that worked with that particular program. I don't know what happened, but you know, in the past we have had, you know, doctors, you know, that was working with mental health, but I don't know what happened that we no longer do, but this is, you know, maybe something that we can, as you say, as we're meeting, work on to help become a solution to help with this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I, um, I, I totally agree with that. And I'll put that on here too, as well. It's to, you know, look at what that, uh, Get, get back in contact with some of those doctor's offices that were um, in existence in the past. Yeah. You know, I just want to just say, you know, that this, this has been an awesome time together. And, um, and as we look at, you know, the solutions and we look at what we're talking about and we're really trying to come together as we look at what we already said, um, our theme of our uh, of this work together is going to be moving Tallulah forward to a brighter future. And then moving forward to a brighter future, we want to make sure that we are, you know, being happy. We are being energetic. We're being excited. We are motivated to get the work done in the community. We pull in the right people at the right time to be a part of it. Um, and not just, you know, at a particular point of time, but we, we're making sure that we're inviting people to the table, continuously getting people involved, understanding what those resources are um, available within our community and um, really moving forward with that. So when we talk about the resources that are available in the community, we are talking about the resources that are available in um, Toulouse, excuse me, in Madison Parish. 
And when we think about those resources that are available in Madison Parish, you know, the first one here that we have, um, you know, I have I have this resource list. You know, we have pre-K 12 and beyond. Could you go back one slide, please? We have pre-K 12 and beyond. Uh, we also have um, a, a, a list of other resources that have been provided that we'll take a look at. Um, you know, substance abuse medicine. Um, so we have the Madison Parish Court Room that's also available that we can give to parents. Um, the youth services. So uh, Pre-K 12 and Beyond has an extensive list. And I'll make sure that all of you have access to the list and that we can find a way to get that out to the community um, as a part of what we're doing with this. So remember, I said we want to be able to um, have people ask for help, educate them on how to ask for help and not just ask for help, but be able to make those connections to those um, providers. So in that, we want those resources. So send me, email me resources that are available in the Madison Parish area so that we can get people you know, to the table. And I put my email address in the chat. I have no problem with doing that. Um, but we want to make sure that we have people come to the table and we build this resource database um, for um, for the Madison Parish. And we can continue to push that out. And as we continue on with the work, at the end of the day, we have this, um, this resource list that's available, not just for us, but that we can provide to the community. And I know we talked about some resources that people just don't really understand that if you go here, you can get these connections. But maybe outlining some of those connections that exist might also be good so that people will know and understand, oh, I didn't quite understand or I didn't know that if I went there, I can also get access to X, Y, and Z. So making sure that we have some of those pieces outlined too as well. And Miss Julia, um, I'd like to you know turn it over to you so that you can talk a little bit about um, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority and all the awesome stuff that you have available that you bring out to the parishes. Thank you, Dr. Weish. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, we that I noticed and picked up on is the main theme here in Madison Parish. What is going on? Just like the song, uh, just like the song was saying. So one of the ways that we can help determine what's going on is to gather data from the community. And one of the ways that we're doing that, uh, I'm going to talk about this briefly, is a food insecurity survey. And they're going to share that in the chat box. We have partnered with the Food Bank of Northeast Louisiana to help determine uh, mental health needs, behavioral health needs, and food insecurity needs in all of the 12 parishes across Northeast Louisiana. That includes Madison Parish. So what is going on? That's the way that we can determine what is going on. We need a maximum amount of participation on this survey. Um, it helps us to figure out different ways to serve our community. So if um, you know of anybody that could, you know, spare a few minutes to take the survey, we have it available um, in a Google Doc link. It doesn't take long at all. And this helps us gather regional data to help us um, to further address what we call these negative social determinants of health, like what we've been talking about. And, you know, that includes access to quality housing, transportation, um, access to quality behavioral and um, addiction-based health care, and so on and so forth. So um, another thing that I wanted to talk about today is our mobile app, which is available on the Google Play Store if you have an Android phone. I do not, so I won't be able to show you, but I did take a screenshot of um, you know what it will be looking like when you go on there. And so it is, um, this is just kind of like an overview. It's multiple tabs that you'll see when you go on the app. But this um, is a great way to get people resources who um, they, maybe they don't have, um, maybe they're in a rural area. Maybe they don't have access to all of these services, you know, in the brick and mortar store situation. So we have a 24 hour crisis line. If somebody is dealing um, with serious mental, emotional, behavioral health issues, they need to talk to somebody. All of those tabs on the um, on the app bring you directly to a resource. And just from this is just from what I've written down. It's almost a whole page of resources. Um, we can connect those um, who are interested to developmental disability waiver services. We have six clinic locations in uh, the Northeast Delta region, Bastrop, Columbia, Monroe, Ruston, Winsboro, and Tallulah. 
Um, as you guys know, there's an access to a transformation blog where our executive um, director, Dr. Montez Sizer, he posts on there quite frequently, um, you know, his thoughts about the change that we want to make in the area and on various topics involving, you know, the mental health sector um, and other and other topics as well. We have a keep calm line that it can direct you to. And these when you click on these links, they pull you up directly to phone numbers. It's not any extra fluff that you have to go through. Um, we have a crisis text line. If you don't feel like talking to anybody and you're, you know, you prefer the texting method, you can do that too. There's a recovery outreach helpline, suicide prevention lifeline as well. We can connect you to Louisiana 211. Um, there's links to mental health help services from Northeast Delta. We can get you addiction help if you're suffering from tobacco addiction, gambling addiction. We have treatment programs for those. And a lot of these services that we provide um, to, you know, the communities here in Region 8 are regardless of their ability to pay, whether you have insurance or not, Northeast Delta can assist you. And we also um, have our food insecurity resource. Again, we partnered with the food bank. And what a lot of people don't realize about the food bank is, you know, it is based out of Monroe. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's in Monroe. I can't drive that far just to get, you know, pick up food and resources. They have, they partner with various churches in uh, all of the parishes um, in Northeast Louisiana, and they have organized um, food pantry drop-off sites where, and they, you know, do it for certain times in the day, and you can come up and get a box of food, no questions asked. So um, our partnership with them has been very important in, you know, addressing the food insecurity needs. Um, if you know someone who is in need of housing that's dealing with, you know, behavioral mental issues, we um, partner with Easter Seals for transitional housing opportunities. We have social media links. We're very active on our social media. We have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, maybe you don't really want to talk to anybody right now, but you still want to kind of learn about some of those, um, you know, opportunities that you can get through Northeast Delta HSA or any resources on mental and behavioral health. We have a YouTube channel that posts a lot of educational videos on what we've done and what we're continuing to do in the area. Um, we also have featured on the application our prescription drop box locations. If you know anybody that is needing to get rid of prescription medication, uh, maybe it's a, it's a grandparent that, you know, is watching grandkids a lot. They don't want them getting access to their medications. We have several drop box locations and um, all of those locations are available on the app. The clinic locations are available on the app. They have hours of operation phone contact numbers and addresses as well. So, um, and we also have peer support centers in Monroe and Ruston it has those uh, locations as well. And somebody did, I think it was Ms. Kara that mentioned, uh, we do have inpatient uh, recovery treatment centers that we partner with in Marion and Rayville. So, um, you know, back to what we were talking about, a lot of this starts with education, people that don't know what's out there. This is a one-stop resource for all of those things. Um, and, you know, when you look at the application, it can, basically any type of need that you could have related to mental health, behavioral health services, and even prevention and wellness and developmental disability services. Northeast Delta has a resource for that. And the application is, is a great central point to get access to all of those. It even has a button to dial 911. And I checked it and it, and it works. <laughs> so, um, but right now, this is only available on the Google Play Store. So if you have an Android phone, you can get access to it. We're still working on getting it ready for the Apple Store. And um, as soon as it is available, I will be downloading it on my phone. So um, one of the biggest things, you know, we talked about today was educating the community, showing them the resources that are out there. Um, we've heard, you know, the call to address these negative social determinants of health, and we're answering that call, and we're continuing to answer that call. So um, definitely share the app um, and the information on there with anybody that you may know. Again, we're working on getting it available on the, um, on the Apple Store as well. But like I said, anybody that needs help, whether you want to talk to somebody, whether you want to text somebody, or if you just want to go to, like, uh, what Ms. Kara said, a brick and mortar location. We do have those available. And then for those that can't travel, we have options available as well. So um, like I said, we are here to serve the community, Madison Parish and all of the other um, parishes in the Northeast Delta region. And, uh, you know, we want to take care of our people. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Julia. I can't wait till it comes out on Apple so that I can get it. I'm almost considering going back to an Android so that I can get the app. 
But thank you so much for sharing all of those wonderful resources that are available through Northeast Delta Human Services Authority. Um, yes, we will get all of that information out to folks so that you have it and, and people will have it readily available at your fingertips. And of course, you can always go to Northeast Delta's website to get that information too as well. Thank you so much, Miss Julia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much, Northeast Delta team, for, you know, for, for being a part of this, for, um, you know, providing these wonderful resources out to the community um, so that people can get the vital uh, the help that they need. So what's next? What's next is that the Madison Parish Implementation Team will be having a meeting on Tuesday, December the 14th. At 11 o'clock a.m., 11 to 12 noon will be their next meeting that they come together um, to kind of talk about our next steps. What are we going to do now? What's, what's the next thing that we're going to do? Um, again, remember, I already said that this is not just going to be a waste of conversation because a part of this process is to develop that plan, the action plan. So we'll begin to have some conversations about how things look and how we're going to move forward um, with this work um, over the next couple of months. So um, come back, come to that meeting on the 14th. Invite people to the meeting on the 14th. If they didn't come today, that's okay. They can come on the 14th. We had a link. You can email me. I put my email in the chat. So don't forget my emails in the chat. Email me those resources. If you are not on the list already to get these emails um, in regards of this project, email me that too and say, hey, add me to the list, girlfriend. And I'll make sure that you get added to the list that we get this information out to you that you're invited to the next meeting on the 14th because we want to hear from the community. And please, you can pass the information along to other people. It's not a closed invitation. It's not by invitation only. So you can pass the information on to people in the community to have them come and be a part of this. So again, the next meeting is Tuesday, December the 14th at 11 o'clock a.m. And when I will, um, if you haven't already gotten the link, you will receive the link for um, that meeting. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. Well, again, I'd like to thank all of you for being a part of this. Um, this, this amazing time, this wonderful conversation and dialogue that we had together today. Um, in the chat box, you should have already received a link for the um, Stigma Community Survey. So we already dropped that early on. So you should have that already. Then you should also have just recently received a link for the ins Insecurity Survey. So we dropped that while Ms. Julia was talking. And then now you should be receiving a link now for the evaluation. We want to hear from you. We want you to evaluate how this time was together today. We also want to hear from you about some of those other things that we didn't talk about in regards to stigmas and those kinds of things that are being experienced within your parish. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking out your time to be a part of this conversation. This is a vital conversation and it starts with you all. You all are the experts in the, in the parish. You all bring together the information that we need in order co to continue to um, improve the things that are going on within Madison Parish. Also, I will be remiss to, for, uh, to not thank our team of folks that have been a part of this, um, you know, along this way, the She Race team and the Northeast Delta Human Services Authority team. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And as well as the pre K 12 Beyond team, y'all rock, y'all rock in the Madison Parish. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday, December the 14th at 11 o'clock a.m. And again, if if you have not received that link, please, please, please email me and I'll make sure that you get it. Have a wonderful, wonderful, productive day, everyone.